A fantastic morning to everyone. I mean, you have been doing an excellent job this whole week. And now we come to the math section where you will even be more entertained in terms of how I can improve my math in the country, in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And trust me, we have a dynamic lady who will do that for us. But before I introduce her, I will just go over a few things that I would like for you to notice. Number one, I want you to hold all of your questions and answers at the end of the session because the speaker will entertain them at the end. You can put all of your questions in the Q and A section of this particular presentation. And after that, I will also post the link so that you will be able to evaluate this session. Without further delay, I welcome you. I introduce a dynamic educator, an educator who is passionate about what she does and will lend a helping hand to assist anyone in need. This person is none other than Antonia Bain. So welcome her as she comes. A pleasant good morning to everyone. And I say thank you to Dr. Roll for asking me to present in today's presentation. And with that said, before I say anything, I want to just um, clarify, you know, I like my whole government name to be called. I'm very ah. happy with my middle name. So my name is Miss Antonia Carmen. I don't want to forget that middle name, Bain, all right? And with that said, we begin our session and... Hey, it's time. Our mathematics webinar where we're going to just learn a few tips, a few trades, a few tricks on how to create those interesting math content videos. Now for this presentation, we just have three simple objectives. Our first objective would be we want to discuss the importance of the use of video education. We want to look at the basic resources that we have or that you may have for video creation. And then we want to discuss what are some things that we make, we need to make sure that we do to ensure that we have an effective video um, product. All right. And so first I ask you this question and you can chat, um, type it in the chat box. Have you ever utilized YouTube in a math lesson before? And I'm sure everybody should be typing the word Y-E-S, Y always, yes, Miss, Miss Helena, all the time, right? Of course. And so what are some of the reasons why we use video? We're using video for the fact that, hey, it is visual for our students. Our students expect to be visually stimulated. They don't want to just see text on the screen all the time. And so video stimulation encourages student interaction with the content as well as the concepts. And it also helps for our students when it comes to information retention. And I'm sure for the majority of us, when we use those videos, they're mostly at the introduction of our lesson and in the middle when we want to give them some sort of demonstration or even sometimes when we want to provide them with extra extra practice. Now, another reason why, especially in this digital and virtual learning environment that we are embarking upon, we want to ensure that we use video because guess what? It is portable. 
portable meaning our students can take it anywhere it is also ubiquitous ubiquitous meaning it is everywhere you don't know who you can reach through a video and i give you a prime example i was asked to assist with some videos for our family life and when we were going into production time and it was time to produce the video they had some students from a particular school and when i walked into the room uh, i kid you not the student was able to tell me my full government name middle name included and of course me as the educator and the adult i'm trying to figure out how you know my name because i don't know you and when i inquired and i asked them about it the only thing they told me was from the virtual school from the ministry of education's platform and i was like oh okay so with that said you do not know who and where your videos are going to go you're not just teaching people here in the commonwealth of the bahamas these videos can go viral another reason why we want to utilize video within our classroom and I saw someone said it before is the fact that we can use it for reinforcement. Our videos can be paused, they can be rewind, they can be fast forwarded. And so we can use them in class discussions, we can use them for review purposes for our students. And then another or the last reason I want to share rather is the fact that videos are what I call bite size. They're bite size, meaning that they allow you to break down complex ideas and information into more manageable chunks for our students. So rather than the student listening to a two hour lecture about how to multiply, that can be done in a simple two to three minute video for our students. Now, that's the why we need to utilize video within our classrooms. But before we even get into that, we have to ensure that we have the resources for video creation. I can't say I want to create a video if I don't have the materials needed to make this video. So what are some things you think you need in order to create effective videos? Type it in the chat box. What are some materials and resources that you need to create your, your content? You need good lighting, yes. Very important, especially if you want to use green screen. You need a camera, you need manipulatives, yes. So some of the resources that we may need, and these are just the basic resources that you may need. You are going to need either your laptop or your PC, and it needs to come with a camera, and a good one at that, not Betsy, because I have a Betsy, and I have another one. We don't want to use Betsy for video production, all right? So we have laptop. We also need some sort of PowerPoint program. Now, PowerPoint would be for my PC lovers, but for Mac lovers like me, we are going to use the PowerPoint version, which is Keynote to use to create our videos. And I just love, love, love Keynote. And I'll tell you a little bit about why I love Keynote a little bit later. Stop showing off. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> you need a proper microphone, yes. We need to make sure that what we're saying is audible. We need, I saw someone said this, connectivity. We need internet. That is extremely important. And then um, we need some sort of account, social media account that we're going to upload this video to. And the reason for that is because we do not want to have our students' devices filled with a bunch of MP4 files because those video files can be really big. So if we have some sort of social media account that we can upload it to, and we are just giving them the link and they can click on that link and view the video at their leisure, then that's a little bit um, more feasible for them in terms of spacing on their, on their devices. Now, with that said, I'm going to send you a poll. And I just want to see, based on the items that are listed on the screen, how many of you feel that you have all of the resources that you need to begin your video production? So I'm going to sh share a poll with you. And you should be able to click onto that poll 
and take all of the resources that you have right now at your disposal to help you make your video. If you have your laptop, your internet, your camera, your microphone, and some sort of social media account, click on that. And we will see how many people are ready to be producers. No YouTube, but you can use accounts like Vimeo, or if you can upload to your Facebook. Facebook is somewhere that our students can, our students are always on. Um, so not necessarily YouTube. When I say YouTube, I mean any social media account that you can upload, upload it to. Oh, Raven, you need resources. How, what resources like what, Raven? You don't have a computer? We could start off small. Oh, no device. Okay. All right. So I am going to end the poll right there. And it looks like maybe about 60% of us in the room say that we have what it takes to create our videos. Laptop, internet, camera, microphone, and some sort of social media account. So once we have those resources, then we are halfway there. Um, Ms. Ramming, remind me about that later and I'll tell you what I use to make the poll, okay? Don't forget, put it in the Q&A so Ms. Dr. Rowell can ask me that question later. All right. So, the next question would then be why? If there are so many videos out there on YouTube that we are already using, then why is it that we need to be creating our own videos? Well, first reason being is the fact that sometimes the terminology of the videos that we see on YouTube, they do not reflect what it is that we want our students to know. They're not using the words regrouping or maybe the words product and factors and multiples. They're just basic in their terminology. And so if we want to ensure that our students get this consistent math language, sometimes we have to produce that on our own. Also, when we look at some of the videos on YouTube, the pronunciation is off, all right? Sometimes instead of saying thousand, you hear people saying thousand, thousand, or instead of saying um, three, you hear them saying tree. And you want to ensure that we give our students, not just because it's not a grammar lesson or a language lesson that we don't give them that proper um, standard English. So not all of the videos are pronunciation ready, I would say. And then another reason is the fact that some of the content that we need to go into, we can't find it in, on the YouTube videos, especially if the information is just specific to something that we are teaching into in the Bahamas. It may not go as in depth or it may not even be there. I know during the COVID experience, when we had to find resources, the topic for grade six was SI format. And I, um, for time and date, I looked up and down on YouTube to try and find a video. And I could not find not even one video on SI format. So I had to create that instructional resource myself because it was something that the students needed to know. And then of course, I saw someone said it earlier, it's not relatable. The pictures don't reflect the Bahamas, the examples don't reflect the Bahamas, so our students cannot relate to what they are seeing or hearing. And then, of course, like we all know, when our students see teacher on the screen, or they hear teacher's voice in the video. That is gonna stick with them and they're gonna listen even more intently than if that was just a regular YouTube video. They're going to get super excited because now teacher is a movie star. She's not just a regular teacher, all right? So those are some of the reasons why we need to create our own videos. Now, when we get into video creation, there are some things we need to look out for. And I wanna share some examples of some videos that I would have created. I won't go through the entire video, but I just wanna pique your interest a little bit. And then we'll go through some tips and then 
hopefully time permits and we can actually create um, a short, quick mini video within mm -hmm. this presentation. So just wanna show you a quick example. Now this first example is an example of a content video that I recently did for rounding decimals, okay? So I will just play a couple minutes of it. Listen carefully. Hello, boys and girls. Miss Bain here. Today, we're going to be learning the steps for rounding decimal numbers. Rounding to decimal places is exactly like rounding whole numbers. Knowing the decimal places are very important when rounding decimals. Let's do a quick decimal place value review. In a decimal number, we have a decimal point. The places to the left of the decimal point are the ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, and the list goes on. The places to the right of the decimal point are tenths, hundreds, thousands, and again, the list goes on. Decimals are read using the word and. For example, this number is read as four and 18 hundredths. Knowing that this number is read as five and 218 thousandths. When reading a decimal number, we read the numbers to the left of the decimal point as we would read any ordinary number. When we get to the decimal point, we say and, and then we read the number to the right of the decimal point as if we read any ordinary number. The only difference here is we identify the place of the last digit. And in this example, the place of the last digit is the thousandths place. The eight is in the thousandths place. Now the steps for rounding decimal numbers are that as if we were rounding whole numbers. Do you remember our whole number decimal wrap? Let's quickly review. It goes something like this. Find the place value, circle that digit, move it to the right and underline it. Zero through four, the circle stays the same. Five through nine, add one to the game. Now flex your muscles like a hero. Digits to the right change into zero. All the other digits remain the same. Now you're a winner at the rounding game. All right, so that was just a quick example of a content video. Something where we can show our students the information, they can pause it where they need to pause it, rewind it if they need to, and they have it at their disposal if it is uploaded to a social media platform. Now the next video that I wanna show you, this one is actually an interactive video, so you need to get your fingertips ready. This one is teaching our students or reminding them about fact fluency. And so as the students watch this video, especially in this virtual environment, as they watch the video, and you are sharing it with them, you can see in the chat um, exactly what it is that they are saying. And so we are going to actually do this activity as if I was the teacher and you were the student. So let's see. All right, so hey. this is a fact fluency video. And so when it gets to the point where they ask you to say the answer, you're going to type it in the chat box, okay? Now, let me give you a little disclaimer. No need to worry. The numbers aren't that high. It's only two digit numbers, okay? Um, so we should be, we should be fine. <laughs> okay, sixth graders, it's time to practice our fact fluency. 
What is math fluency? Math fact fluency is the ability to recall answers to basic math facts automatically and without hesitation. Why is fluency important? Well, automaticity in math is fundamental to success in many areas of higher mathematics. Also, without the ability to retrieve facts automatically, students like you are likely to have trouble in later grades. So, let's practice our math fact fluency. A math fluency fact will appear on the screen. You have only three seconds to respond before the answer is revealed. Are you ready? Get ready, get ready. Let's begin. 10 plus 3. Awesome, awesome. 13. 8 take away 5. Mm. 3. 7 times 7. Yeah. 49. 20 divided by 4. 5. 11 plus 11. 22. 6 plus 4. 10. 14 take away 6. 8. 15 divided by 3. 5. 10 plus 5. 15. 8 plus 8. 16. If you got all of those correct, give yourself a round of applause, students. You did an awesome job. Remember to continue to practice your math fact fluency. This lesson was created by Miss Antonia Bain. Listen, Corey, I know you couldn't get nine wrong. No way. No way, sorry, Bob. No. Now, I want to make a comment. I hear Dr. Rose saying that this video, this is not one of the previously done videos. This is one of the videos that will be on the platform because we would have, Dr. Rose would have formed some teams to assist with the creation of videos for the new academic school year. So this isn't one of, this one here isn't one of the older ones. This is a newer um, video that will be on the platform come when school opens up. All right, so good job to those people who had their fingers ready. I saw some of you were on the ball and that's just a short video that we could use in our classrooms to help our students practice their math fact fluency. We can do it with vocabulary. We can do it um, with other content skills and it does not take that long. And so we're gonna try to see if we can do that, create that at the end of this presentation if time permits. All right, so let's take a, oh, sorry about that, Miss, Miss Hall, sorry. Well, let's take a closer look now at some of the tips that I wanna share with you in regards to making your videos and becoming your very own producer. So one of the first things that I want us to take into consideration is we need to design and create. This is the first step, design and create. Now, when we design and create, I am going to swap screens right now and I wanna share with you another screen and you should be able to see it. This is where I get some of my PowerPoint templates from. So I'm not sure if you've heard about Slides Go. Um, it is awesome in terms of getting your PowerPoint templates. You can get some very creative templates from here. Um, if I slide up, maybe I wanna do a Halloween theme, a notebook theme for my video. Um, so depending on the theme that I want to do, I can't, yes, it is free. It is free. All you're going to do once you get that particular theme, once you choose your theme, you click 
on it and let's see if this is going to carry us where we need to be. Okay, so you would click on it and once you click on it, right in the corner, you see it says download this template and it gives you your options. You can do it as Google Slides or you can do it as a PowerPoint template. You can download as a PowerPoint template. Now that is not the only place I like to go. I also like to shop at um, Slides Carnival and here you get the same type of, not necessarily the same style, but this is another place that you can get some free templates from. And what I really wanted to show you with the templates are the amount of slides and the different ways that they show you, you can use um, this presentation. Let me see. Yeah, so if I scroll down and you should be able to see what I'm doing, they give you so many different slide types. So here, I may just need to insert a picture here and put my content on the side. I don't have to do much to this slide. Um, if this is my title slide, I can use that. If I want to insert a quote somewhere. So they have these slide templates already made up based on how you want to present your information. So each template has maybe about 30. This one has 30. Um, Slides, carnival goes sometimes into 40 something slides. Um, and what I really, really want to show you is at the end where they give you the options of if you want to put something in a project, something mobily. So maybe I want to play a game and I have the questions coming in the cell phone. I can do that. Or if I want to put it in the tablet screen or computer screen. And then the exciting part is at the end, they have all of these little um, pictures and bitmojis that you can use in your presentation if you decide to do so. And so Slides Carnival as well as Slides to Go would give you those options, all right? So first and foremost, we design and create. Now, Let's just say you are presented, you are a student, and you're presented with a slide that looks like this. As a student, what is going to be your first impression about this presentation? This being the title slide. What's going to be boring? Thank you very much, Miss Riley. Exactly. And so how we introduce our um, content video is going to capture the student. It's dry, yes, Miss Rosemary, very dry. So first tip, we need to ensure that our presentations are visually stimulating. Add your graphics, add your tables, add your charts, whatever you need to bring across that information. Now, when we do that, we're not adding any irrelevant pictures just to say, oh, I want a picture on the screen. No, it has to relate to what it is that we are doing. First tip. Next thing when we talk about design, when I see this slide as a student, what am I going to think? In terms of design purposes, what am I going to think? Too much information. When I see this, I automatically tune you right out. I cannot hear anything you are saying to me, even though the information on this slide may be really important. I cannot hear anything you are saying to me. So we want to ensure that we keep the text to a minimum. Not everything that we say, we need to write on the slide in terms of text. It will cost the students, yes, Mr. Cole, to lose, to lose focus. Also, we want to ensure that we use animations to emphasize our points. And I think for mathematics, this is mo the most crucial crucial um, point because with mathematics, we have to show them the processes and in showing them the process, you have to use animations. And so sometimes I have a slide that has up to 80 something animations. Yes, 80 something animations, just because I want to ensure that as I'm speaking one by one, the numbers are popping up or the things are popping up so as not to confuse um, the students. And so here's a prime example. I have, I want to do a review with my students in terms of addition. 
and I as the teacher put everything on the slide like this. This is not as visually stimulating to the students and for the student that does not know how to add, they will still not know how to add after this because I provided them with the answer before even going through the process with them. So we wanna ensure that we use our animations. And so maybe I may say, okay, boys and girls, today we're going to add two numbers. We're going to add the numbers 2,341 and 1,130. That way they know, okay, those are my two numbers. And even go further and say, those two numbers are considered to be our add ends. Now, boys and girls, when we add, we can start adding by the ones place or otherwise known as the units place. Let's begin adding one ones plus zero ones is equal to one one. Four tens plus three tens is equal to seven tens. Three hundreds plus one hundred is equal to four hundred. And then two thousand plus one thousand is equal to 3,000. And I can even go a little bit further and add in some more animations if I want to go back over. Remember, boys and girls, the numbers 2,341 and 1,130, when we add them together, they will give us the sum 3,471. And so as I'm speaking, my animations are, are happening. Now, when we talk about animations, we have to be very careful with them because animations can be confusing. And the reason being, yes, we're gonna talk a little bit more. This is a part two, this is just part one um, in terms of how to create. I just wanted to give you an overview. And I think tomorrow you come back and we can do a part, we are doing a part two to it. So what we don't finish today, we will, we will get into tomorrow in terms of the step-by-step -step processes. Um, so like I was saying, in terms of animations, you have to be very careful because there are so many different types of animations. You have what we call entrance animations. And so those are the things that that's how we want our information or our, um, text, our graphics to come in. Then you have what we call or in-text animation, meaning that the words were already there. I just want to now add emphasis onto it. So this is my emphasis animation now coming in. Then we have what we call a motion path animation. I want it to move in a particular way. And then we have what we call exit animation. I'm now finished saying what I want to say. I want this to come off of the screen. And so I allow it to exit gracefully in a particular, in a particular way. So we'll talk a little bit more about animations um, a little bit later and how we have to be very careful with them because if we do not layer them right, our video is not going to come out properly, all right? So that's use of animations to emphasize our points. And then we want to ensure that our videos have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We're building a story for the students, okay? So we wanted to have a beginning, middle, and end. Now. What are some things that we can put in the beginning, in the middle, or in the end of our video? Well, some things that I like to put in the beginning, I like to have, depending on if it's a lesson video, my objectives. In the beginning, you can put your vocabulary, your definitions. You can also even, even give them some background information. Maybe you go over some prerequisite information. Maybe you even present problem to stir their interest before you actually go into what it is that they're going to be learning today. And then of course, the middle is where all of the meat is happening. That's where you share with the students the content, you provide them with examples so that they know exactly what it is that they are learning today. And then at the end of your video, you close always with a recap. I like to review always with a recap. Um, you provide your references. And then of course, like I always tell anybody that does anything, you label your stuff. You worked hard on that, put your name on that, sign, seal, delivered, that's yours, all right? 
So label your longing. And so I'm just going to now show you another video, but this video, I won't go through the whole thing. I'm just, I just want to show you how you have your beginning, your middle, and your ending based on the information that was just shared. So this one is on divisibility. And already for our candy lovers, this is piquing their, their interest for those sweet tooth children. All right. Let's talk divisibility. This is going to be sweet. Take a look at these two friends. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pieces of candy. Can these candies divide equally amongst the two friends? Hmm. This is where the divisibility rules come in. Let's talk divisibility. All right, so that's the introduction. Then let's go down to the middle where you get some content. The digits 36 are divisible by four. So that makes 1,300,036 also divisible by four. What about numbers that are divisible by five? If a number is divisible by five, the last digit is zero or five. Let's look at this example. The number 12,349. The nine is not a zero or five. So this number is not divisible by five. What about 287,435? The last digit is a five. That means that this number is divisible by five. Now, then let's scroll. Now let's scroll down to the end and let's end it all up. Four, six, or eight. And because nine does not end in those digits, it's not an even number. So these candies cannot be divided equally amongst the two friends. Don't forget the following divisibility rules. Divisibility rules can help you when finding factors. This lesson was created by Miss Antonia Bain. All right, so just an example of how you can bring it all together, making it flow for our students. Good, so that brings us to, so we've already designed, and now after we design the next step in this process, the next step in this process is we now need to record. So it's now studio time, all right? Now, in studio time, there are a couple of things that we need to ensure that we pay attention to. And the first thing we need to ensure um, that we pay attention to is the fact that we need to have a script. You need to read from something for those of us that uh, may not feel comfortable reading from off of the top of their head. Now, I'm going to tell you something in all honesty. If you've seen those videos, those math videos on the virtual platform, I've not, I don't read from a script, no. Um, but if you feel that you need to read from a script so that it's smooth, it um, flows a little bit more smoother for you, then that's fine. Me, I'm a talker. And so because I'm a talker, I can talk from the top of my head. Um, so, but my advice, read from a script, especially if we're just starting out uh, and we want to ensure that everything, everything flows smoothly. Now, when we are creating our script, there are a couple of things that we need to pay attention to. And what are those things? First of all, let's look and we'll find out. Once you've completed the pre-production work for your micro-learning video, it's time to start scripting. Here are a few best practices to keep in mind. One video, one objective. Everything in your script should tie back to your main objective, especially with a very short video. 
tell a story. Creating a narrative and developing characters will help you connect with your audience and frame your video. Keep traditional story structure in mind. Your video should have a clear beginning, middle, and end, and each section should relate back to your main objective. Keep it simple. Your sentences should be short and sweet. Avoid unnecessary adjectives and adverbs, and use the active tense. Not everything needs to be spoken. Think of your script as a support system for the visuals in your video. The language you choose should complement rather than compete with these images. Don't waste time. You don't need lengthy introductions or conclusions. Get to the point. The beauty of a microlearning video is that viewers can rewind a specific section or rewatch the whole video if and when they need a refresh. Read more to learn about scripting. All right, so when we talk about our scripts, we need to ensure that, like the video said, it's simple, we get straight to the point, we cut out all of the fluff, and we keep in mind what is the objective of this video. What is it that I want my students to get from this video? Also, when we do our recording, super important, we need to ensure that we find a quiet, space to record. Now I know this is hard because you cannot control sometimes what your neighbors are doing. Numerous times I tried to record and the dog barking from the neighbor or they decided to mow their lawn at that particular time. And so, you know, there's nothing that you can do in those instances, but find another time um, to record, but when you go into your quiet space, like most people would have shared already, make sure you have good lighting. Good, good lighting, especially if you want your video, your, your face to be on the video. If you're just doing a voiceover video, then you just need a quiet space. But if you're doing a visual video, you need your green screen, quiet space, as well as good lighting okay and not just because the light turns on mean that it's good lighting it needs to be directed in the position in where you're stand in in which you're standing so that you look clear and crisp on the screen and you don't look fuzzy or anything anything like that in addition to that you need to speak clearly like we said before one of the reasons why we're making our videos a is for proper pronunciation. And so if we are going to speak incorrectly, then what's the purpose of, of doing it? We need to make sure that, yes, yeah, sorry, quiet. Thank you so much. Uh, we need to make sure that we speak clearly in our videos. We also need to ensure that we utilize the mathematical language. Again, this was one of the reasons why we said we have to create our videos because the terminology in the video is not up to par in terms as to what we would want our students to know. And so with that said, we're going to get into another activity. And so I hope you guys have either a phone or you can open up another browser and we are going to do an interactive activity I'm sure the majority of us have played Kahoot before, so I am ready for you. So I want you to open up another browser or, you know, go on your cell phone and let's see if you know your math vocabulary. Now I'm not, I'm gonna put another disclaimer out there. It's not going to be at college level, okay? You're gonna be able to answer it. Cause I know sometimes people are a little apprehensive because they think that they may not be able to complete something successfully. It's not college level. Um, I assure you of that, okay? So let's see if you have your devices, you can go to kahoot.it.com and type in the pin code and once, couple of persons have gotten in, then, oh, hold on, let me go back, because I- I can't believe we're about to buy our first house. Yeah, it seems like just yesterday we went on our first date. <sighs> that first date that-
my apologies let me go back because i want it to be where i can start it on my own i want it to be where i can start it to make sure i can start it on my own okay so we're not waiting too long sorry about that so yes so once you're there type in the pin code and let's get started do you know your math vocabulary i can't believe we're about to buy our first house yeah it seems like just yesterday we went on our first date <sighs> That first date that Aunt Sally almost ruined. I mean, she was everywhere. Did she have all the recipes? She was everywhere. I didn't do anything. I didn't do the worst thing ever. I didn't do anything. I didn't You know what? You don't even have to worry about it. She won't be here. I'm all about my properties. My mathematical properties. I'm all about my properties. Just like Monopoly. I did and associative, we got commutative and distributive. That's just the way it is. You got to learn the key. First one up, and that's commutative. It goes A plus B equals B plus A. That's like A plus three equals three plus eight, or eight times three equals three times eight. Just put them in a different order. Not associative can't wait, uh. Cause I'm all about my properties, uh, my mathematical properties. That's right. I'm all about my property, yes. Just like Monopoly, there's identity and dissociative. We got commutative and distributive. That's just the way it is. You got to learn the kids. Next one up, and that's associative. It goes A plus the quantity B plus C equals the quantity A plus B plus C. All we did was move the parentheses. I need you to learn this conceptually. Now, identity is easy. Class, please believe me. Example, three plus zero equals three. All right. Um, just so that you can hear me. Um... I'm trying to see the timer. I thought I said it where I can start it on my own, but they have this in white writing, so I cannot even see. Um, so what happens, and obviously, uh, what happens when, yes, the song is very nice, Miss Forbes, I get distracted. What happens when you do not set it to where you can start it on your own is that every time somebody joins a meeting, it is going to start um, back up again from 15 seconds. So we're down to zero, which is perfect. So we're gonna start and we should be good to go. When you are dividing fractions, you are actually, you actually have to multiply by one. When you're dividing, you actually have to multiply by the reciprocal, yes. Go ahead, Empress. A mathematical sentence containing letters, numbers, and symbols with When you add or subtract fractions, you know it. stop right there awesome sauce so shout out to empress sassy and sanders 
for an excellent, an excellent job on knowing their mathematics vocabulary. Shout outs to you guys, all right? Good. Um, and then one more thing I wanna say in terms of recording, we wanna make sure that when we record, we also use varying tones in our voice. We don't want a monotone voice on the video. So sometimes you bring it down a little bit and sometimes you carry it up for the students. And then most importantly, you have to sound excited. If you sound um, dry or boring, then that is what the students are going or how the students are going to feel. They're not gonna get as much from it if you do not sound excited about what it is that you are saying, okay? Good, point number three, we wanna make sure that we save our PowerPoint. Now, before we save, we actually need to view it back first. So we need, I always advise you to watch it in slideshow mode first before you do any saving to make sure that everything is where you need it to be. And then I also suggest you save two versions. You save the regular PowerPoint version as well as you save the export it as an MP4 file. And we will probably have to go through all of that tomorrow. Um, exported as an mp4 video file and then of course step number four so it's just four easy steps step number four is upload and share and so when we upload and we share we are putting it onto our YouTube or Vimeo or Facebook platforms we are sharing it as a URL with our students because the URL is going to make it smaller so it's easier to share or if we have email addresses, we can email the MP4 file to them. And that brings me to the end of part one of how to create these exciting math videos for our students. Now, there is one more thing I wanna share with you, and I will leave this in terms of the exciting math video, and then we'll talk a little bit more in part two um, of our session tomorrow. So I just want to share one more thing with you and then I'll turn it back over to Dr. Rowe. Um, and that would just be Powtoons, okay? I'm making a video in Powtoons. Powtoons is just awesome, all right? And I'll share just a little brief something with you that I made in Powtoons and then we will turn it over. Hello everyone, I'm so excited to see you. Welcome to another 6th grade math drill with Miss Antonia Bain. Let's get started. Let's take a look at the 5 math terms for the week. Term number 1. Polygon. A polygon is a flat shape with three or more sides and all sides connect. Turn number two. Symmetry. Symmetry is when one object or part of an object looks exactly alike after a slide, flip, or turn. A shape can have line symmetry or rotational symmetry. Term three, translation. Translation is the movement of an object over a distance. Another word for translation is slide. Let's look at these figures translate. Reflection is when an object is flipped across a line. It is also referred to as a mirror image. Another word for reflect is flip. All right, and we'll stop it right there in terms of the video because we only have a short time left. Um, and at this time,
time, I just say thank you for listening to my squeaky voice for the last um, about 55 minutes. And I turn it back over to Dr. Ro. Thank you all so much. Um, Antonio, could you stop sharing your screen so I can put the link? Thank you so much, Miss Antonia Carmen Bay. I have to make sure get the name right because Antonia did such an excellent job. I tell you, she is awesome. So I'm going to look for the link and I'm going to put it in the chat so that all of you will be able to Okay, I'm getting new to this. Ah, that's the form right there. So you can follow the form. And while you're doing so, we will ask Miss Spain to answer these questions. Our first question is from Miss Deandra Dean. She is asking, as it relates to using videos in our lesson, can you explain the importance of copyright laws as it relates to inserting videos into PowerPoint presentations or putting them on a web page or web blog? And this is the second part. As some videos on the MOE site are in YouTube videos. Okay, well, when it comes to copyright, um, and it's a little tricky because we know within our classrooms, we always use video in our PowerPoint lessons, but the difference with us in our classroom versus being on um, a platform is the fact that we're not taking all of the credit. If our students want to review that video again, they, we are directing them to the YouTube site where they are going to, to get that video from. So using it in your classroom is fine. Now, when you want to upload it to another site, it's a little bit different. If you want to use, like, um, for example, how we did the ministry's platform, we can upload YouTube videos there. Why? Because we didn't put the YouTube video on our YouTube site and then put that particular link there. That link, when the students watch that, is still going to take that to take them to the originator of that video. So we're not taking credit for it. We're just providing them with an avenue or an act, providing them access to view the video. That's different now from putting a video inside your actual PowerPoint presentation and then converting that PowerPoint presentation into video to post up onto the ministry's website. That is totally different because once you convert that to video, you are saying that that entire video belongs to you. And that's not true. And sometimes when you do that, YouTube, even before you even look, YouTube pulls it right back down. You don't get a chance to put everything, everything up. Um, and so for me personally, when I create my PowerPoint videos, I try my PowerPoint videos. I don't put anybody else's video in my video. No, I just use the content. And if I want the students to see that video, then I provide it at for supplementary resources, but I won't insert that into my, my video. Okay, the second question is, what apps or software did you use to create the poll? The poll that was actually within um, Zoom, you can use polling in Zoom, but the trick with that is it's easier you have to set up your meeting and then once you set up your meeting there is a tab down at the bottom normally where you see copy link copy copying the um, invitation link if you go to poll you'll see something that says polling slash survey you click on that it will allow you to add a poll and you can go and type in the information that you would want to do a poll on so you can do single choice polls where you have to just choose one response or like I did a multiple choice poll where you can choose more than one response. So you do that through Zoom. Okay, and we 
have Helena Riley. She's asking, with the best app for video making? With the best app for video making? Now, a lot of my videos, 90% of them, 90 or 85, I made in Keynote, which is the PowerPoint version on a Mac. Um, other than that, I used PowToons. And when you see me in the video, that is a little bit more than just PowerPoint or PowToons. That's some video editing having to happen because I have to put it in either WeVideo or I can use my iMovie on my Mac and um, put it in my video. Now, when I do that, I have to actually use a green screen to do um, to speak in front of my video. Now, I see someone else asking about green screen. Let me tell you something. Yes. I'm gonna turn off my camera, right? And I don't want to, I don't want you all to have no one might. But thankfully, you know, God just to speak in mysterious ways. When I um, painted my house, there's a green wall in my house, right? So I technically, let me, let me um, take off my, I technically don't have a green screen. I, I just have a green wall. So that green wall I use, but you can use a green sheet. You can use um, green chart paper. You can use a trifold board, you know, the trifold board that has the different colors. You can use a green trifold board to get the green screen effect to get the background. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, Crystal is asking, what would be a good brand or type for purchasing a microphone? Um, honestly, uh, I wouldn't suggest purchasing a microphone by itself. I would suggest purchasing a microphone, a camera, a video camera, a nice camera, because most of those cameras have microphones embedded into them. Now it's going to cost a little bit because you have the Logitech ones that cost about maybe um, 80 to $100, somewhere around there, but it all depends on what it is that you are looking for. You have some really cheap ones that you can use too, but Miss Wilson, I can give you my email. I'll type it in the chat box and okay. I can possibly look up some other brands for you um, to assist you with that. So that's my email in the the chat box right there. Okay. How long do you suggest the video should be? That's another uh, question. No more than about eight to 10 minutes, 10 minutes max. No more than eight to 10 and only that long, honestly, if you have like how in some of the videos you have a lot of examples in it, but if it's just straight content, no more than maybe about five minutes. I know because we are I running. Sorry, I was gonna say our students, their attention span is just as short as ours. And so if we're not gonna watch a 10 minute video, more than likely, they won't watch a 10 minute video either. Especially if, you know, it's not visually appealing and it does not have audio um, intonation and all of that. I will copy the email again for those persons that are still asking. Okay, our final question for the day is, how did you get the classroom scene in the back of you? How did, you, how did you get that? That is through Zoom again. When you look in your, well, if you were, if we were in meeting mode, we're in webinar mode, so you can't see it, but in a regular meeting mode, you go by your camera, on your camera you see, and of course you're gonna need the green screen to do this. So once in the back of you is green, you go by your, the video camera, you click the button, the arrow, it will say choose virtual background, you click on that and they provide you with some background. So these are the basic ones that come in the system. This is something I would have downloaded. They allow you to insert pictures that you download as well. So these are all my downloaded backgrounds that I have. So I, I put these ones in here myself. So I can be in outer space anytime I want to. I can go into the classroom, I can float around, I can go in the beach, wherever wherever I want to. Okay, thank you so much, Miss Spain, and thank you so much, teachers, you've done an excellent job, and I know that you have completed your evaluation form, and we want you to have a wonderful day, and God bless you as we leave, and make sure you sign out as you exit.
Thank you.